Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Virginia Simnott. I'm the program director for the uh, Evergreen Health MS Center. And I thank you all for coming today. I think this is going to be a very good discussion. I want to introduce the speakers for today. We are, have the great pleasure of having Dr. Laura Plaskin from Evergreen Health Urology join us. Dr. Christy Sherman, Psychology at Evergreen Neuroscience Institute, and Amy Gordon. I'm afraid I don't have a picture of her, but she's way in the back here, our physical therapist who has expertise in pelvic floor rehabilitation. I'd like to begin our discussion today just to give you an overview of what we do at the Evergreen Health MS Center. We certainly do provide comprehensive care. We provide diagnosis and second opinion. And we do have an active research program that I just want to call your attention to. My colleague, Dr. Ted Brown, and I are really excited about having a number of open and enrolling trials that you might be interested in. We do have disease-modifying drug studies. We have a new insomnia study. Dr. Brown is very proud of a laughter therapy study, which you might find very interesting. Um, we have one that's looking at specifically reducing injection site pain for a product called Plegridy. We do have an ongoing trial that is looking at how to improve bladder control, and this is pertinent to today's uh, talk. And finally, I have a grant to look at whether there is a change in gut bacteria or the microbiome for patients who are contemplating first starting a drug called Texadera. And so if you have interest in learning more about these studies, the telephone number is on this uh, slide as in your syllabus. So just to get our brains in gear, thinking about MS and to be sure we're on the same track, uh, multiple sclerosis is a disorder exclusively of the central nervous system. And in this uh, scenario, we are talking brain and spinal cord. The brain is just a really remarkable computer, it's the most sophisticated construct you will ever know about. Neural networks govern the exchange of information, where, whether it's moving a leg, vision, language, making decisions, these are all hardwired in our brain. If you were to look at a brain on the table in cross section, you would see two large hemispheres of brain tissue, the outer surface being folded, and to the naked eye looking kind of gray, as well as some gray areas in the mid area or mid structures. These deeper areas look kind of pale to the naked eye. And if you were to look at these areas under the microscope, the gray matter is composed of billions of nerve cell bodies and the pale areas, or white matter, represent these extension cords called axons that are coated with a material called myelin. And that is uh, what is absolutely important for governing transmission of information from one nerve cell to the neighboring nerve cell. We look at it a little bit differently in this cartoon. A normal axon in yellow here and the coating material, myelin, actually is multiple layers of insulation. When we are talking about MS and the auto-reactive immune cells, they are targeting components of this myelin and causing destruction of this insulating material. This, in turn, may interrupt or block communication from one nerve cell to its neighboring cell. There's a lot of interest in what is the trigger for MS, and this is very hard to say is one thing. There are now over 200 genes that have been identified that play a role in the risk of developing MS, and in some circumstances, genes that actually appear to be protective in populations against MS. But there have to be other factors besides genetics for the expression of the disease. And this may include some environmental factors, perhaps an infectious agent. We know that this is a disease that's worldwide, but its prevalence is different at different latitudes across the equator. 
We know that uh, as you go north or south of the equator, the incidence of MS increases. But perhaps more importantly, it appears to be more a disease of first world countries and migration patterns from first world countries like Northern Europe and its expansion, the populations expanding across the world. This latitude perception in North America continues and unfortunately Washington, Minnesota and so forth have the highest incidence of MS nationally. We are looking very carefully at what are the modifiable risk factors in the expression or severity of MS. And there's some very interesting work looking at factors such as tobacco smoking. We know that smokers have a higher incidence of moving on to progressive disability than those who don't smoke and that quitting smoking actually lowers the risk of disability back to a non-smoker's risk. There's a lot of interest clearly in vitamin D and deficiency in vitamin D as a role in the short term and intermediate term in promoting MS inflammation. And this is seen in terms of relapse rate as well as MRI activity. And then looking at diet, an interesting study looking at salt intake in the diet, and that high salt intake may be associated with an increased rate of relapses. So again, the take home point here is that there may be some modifiable risks here that you can think about in your own uh, perception of how to control your disease. It's been a very busy time in MS and in development of therapies that attack this autoimmune disease. Back in the early 1990s, we had the, the development of interferon beta as the first product to provide to our patients, and shortly after, latirimer acetate. But then there's been more of an explosion of commercially available medicines in the last few years, including the first biological agent, meaning a monoclonal designer antibody treatment in the introduction of the medicine called Tysabri in 2005. We now have three oral medicines that each have their own unique target in the uh, immune cascade. And now we have other biological agents, again, monoclonal antibodies that have their own unique target, the latest of which was approved only about three weeks ago in the news by the brand name of Ocrevus. Things are moving along, but maybe not at the speed any of us want to see. We certainly all want to see a cure. We want to see uh, agents that repair and are more effective at uh, neuroprotection. And I won't go into that much today. There's a lot of interest in stem cell, I know, and I wish I had updates on that topic, but we'll save that for another day. But I think to know that there is a lot of activity moving the field forward and uh, we'll keep abreast of those developments. So let's focus on why we came together today. We're going to really focus on specific symptoms related to MS. We know that bowel and bladder function, sexual function, depend on the adequate performance of certain parts of the central nervous system. The autonomic nerve is a major component of control of these organs. The autonomic nervous system is divided into two major divisions, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. And each of these divisions um, provide nerve function to different organ systems. For example, to the pupil, to the heart, to the lungs, to the stomach, to the gut, the bowel and the bladder, and each have a complementary role in control. There are additional voluntary nerves or somatic nerves that go to the pelvic floor. And the pelvic floor, as we will hear shortly, has a, an important role in the control of your bowel and your bladder. When there is abnormality due to disruption of signals anywhere along the pathway of these autonomic nerve fibers, this can result in abnormal function of the bowel and the bladder. 
We know that overactive bladder is a very common problem that affects both males and females. We also know that there are different patterns of abnormality that relate to sphincter function, to filling pressure, to the role of the bladder muscles. And we do turn to our urologists many times to help us better define what the pattern is so that we can discuss the appropriate medications and non-medication approaches to care. Similarly, the bowel is also controlled by an extremely complicated coordination of different nerve fibers that control gut motility and sphincter control. And very similarly, bowel and bladder are linked to this autonomic nervous system. And anatomically, Many of these key fibers, as they descend from the brain into the spinal cord down to their target organs, they run closely to nerve fibers that govern leg strength and leg tone. So many times when people have spasticity or weakness in a leg, they will have difficulty or change in bowel or bladder function. And this relates to the anatomy of these key nerve pathways. We will be talking a little later on with the assistance of Dr. Christy Sherman on sexual problems. And we know this is a very common concern. As many as 75% of people will have periodic trouble with sexual function. And clearly there are multiple causes of this issue. Not all of it directly MS. As a result, this can have some very consequential impact on relationships. And this may include a change in self-image or body image. It may lead to performance anxiety and also contribute to a sense of depression. Commonly, unfortunately, we just don't have the time in most of our monitoring MS visits to delve into these questions because we are so packed full of things that we need to prioritize with managing the MS. But we hope to turn to our colleagues on the team to help us work through some of these very important issues that are related to MS. And we do hope to work on drugs, but also non-drug approaches that may be helpful in sexual performance. 